All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is from the Wardroom to the Boardroom podcast. In this episode, we'll be talking about transitioning and also kind of HR benefits. I'm your host, Mayshawn Wilson, heads policy at Google, uh, combat veteran Duke MBA in West Pointer. Today, I have my guest, uh, Mrs. Jessica Ahn, as I know her, but Jessica Lucas now. Uh, she is a senior talent management practitioner. She currently works as the director of talent and culture at RISC 360. She spent time as both an active duty Army AG officer and now works for the Georgia National Guard. She's a graduate of both West Point and Georgetown University, McDonough School of Business. And so without further delay, Jessica, you know, please let our guests and our viewers know a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, so Mayshawn, first, thank you so much for having me on. I feel so privileged and honored uh, to get this opportunity to speak with you and hopefully resonate with your audience So and your followers. So my name is Jessica Lucas, as Mayshawn has given just a great overview of who I am. So currently, I, I mean, I transitioned the military in 2020. Um, I was stationed in D.C. Um, in 2019, I have you know, two young kids and I decided to transition and I joined the current firm I'm with in 2020. I literally took one week of, of leave and decided to join this team. And I'm the director of talent culture. What that means is a little bit of everything. Um, we are, at the time, we're a startup firm. So we're still 43 personnel. We've grown a double since I've been there in the last two years. And um, we were a cybersecurity consulting firm uh, with the offering of software as well. So we're a SaaS company. And so we're, you know, changing and growing and comes to new challenges in my current role as I shift to, you know, just implementing and structuring our HR to recruiting strategies and now focus more on learning and development. So a little bit of everything um, that I'm really excited to kind of speak with y'all about kind of how I navigated my transition and also kind of the corporate America world and the private sector. Awesome. Again, we appreciate your time. And so for our listeners, can you tell us a little bit about how you came to the military, you know, where you're coming from originally and from there, you know, kind of what made you decide to leave the military? Yeah. So, you know, when I, it kind of happened serendipitously when I was in high school trying to figure out what I wanted to do, um, to go to college and what, you know, my purpose. Um, I came from immigrant parents. They did not have a 529 for me. They said, well, good luck and figure yourself out for college. And I was a you know, collegiate athlete, so I was recruited. So I was very fortunate that I was also trying to look for ways to go to, to, to school. Um, and, you know, I got recruited, but I knew in the end, like I was always passionate about people, you know, coming from an immigrant family. We were very proud of like being Americans and like what that afforded our family and opportunity. You know, they can live out their dreams that were very limited at the time in Korea where they came from. So I always wanted to give back because right, we were so blessed and fortunate. So um, joining the military, it kind of was against our endeavors that I got this opportunity to go to West Point. So I joined West, you know, I went to prep school. I did the whole prep, prep sir for one year, use maps. Um, and then I, I you know, graduated in 2011 um, and was an AG officer. Nice. Uh, and then from there, uh, kind of what brought about that change or decision to leave the military? Yeah. So, you know, 10 years or I, mean, I guess like eight years later, um, I'm here I am. I came from the operational field uh, from battalion all the way to division, had a wonderful career, uh, but I w had two little ones at the time. And working in the Pentagon, I had a better tempo, um, not being away for 12 hours a day. So the tempo was better. However, like someone once told me early in my career, you know, the army will move on with or without you. Um, but you have to remember the legacy you're leaving behind and, and, you know, about what really is inherently important to you. And I saw these generals all retire when, when I was working in the Pentagon. And I realized like life is too short and you can find meaning and purpose. Um, one of my mentors says just on a different stage, you know, your purpose is the same. It just may be on a different stage you're performing it on. And for me, it was about one centrally, it was about my family. 
but I also had this like insaneable, insane, like curiosity about just a private sector working with different technology. Like I just knew like we were working with like very <laughs> legacy systems and, and I think because, and to like, I also wanted to kind of figure out like, you know, the, what it was like in the other side, um, finding fulfillment and continuing that while also taking care of my family. Um, but it was not an easy decision. Certainly it wasn't. I mean, I, again, I loved my career, but at the end, like I had to bring back to the things I was not replaceable, which were being a mom to my two, my two wonderful children. So yeah, I made a decision in 2019 that it was my time ideal not ideal window because COVID happened and so there's a lot of hiring freezes so um it was a it was a lot of uncertainty and daunting um very anxious time but I put my faith in myself and God and um so yeah I decided to transition and luckily everything worked out from there on you know getting a job and all of that. When you decided to make that transition can you talk about one, why you decided to stay in HR when typically you'll see veterans kind of explore a few different things, one. And then two, I have a question about the National Guard kind of after that. I didn't know I wanted to go into HR, to be honest. And, you know, I knew I wanted to get into consulting, right? It's that dangling carrot or the thing that you know that people tell you, they calculate the value for you. Well, you should go into management consulting um, and going to grad school as well. Like it was all about management consulting. And I wasn't sure actually what I wanted to do. I just knew I wanted a great company with great culture because culture to me was really important because we come from the military where, you know, our core values and, you know, coming from West Point, all about the values, right? Like that's like our DNA, our, um, our respect, our culture. So I knew that was like very important to me. What the job was, I just kind of was hungry and curious. I, I didn't care so much what I was doing. When I got to Risk 360, I was a consultant first. I was an analyst. And then I kind of started realizing like, I was just drawn to the people operations. And I guess just you, you realize like you're really good at something, but then you actually get passionate about it. Cause again, I, I just care about people. And I just started taking on roles like without, like I kind of knew it was a gap for our company at the time because the co-founders were doing like trying to do all the HR and I just knew it wasn't scalable. And I just asked to get on that bad. I started reading a lot of compliance join different organizations to build that structure. Um, and then I just kind of ran with it and loved it. And so I wasn't sure myself, but I think I love the opportunity they gave me to kind of run with it. So, and I think it's just, again, inherent to like where I came from as an HR professional. It's about taking care of the people, the secret sauce in any organization, whether you're the army or corporate America, the heart of any organization is still the people. That is the secret sauce is good companies know how to invest in people. So, so yeah, that's kind of how I, you know, kind of took this role and kind of ran with it. No, it makes sense. So from there, you kind of found those gaps, leverage your skills and mm -hmm. from there, just kind of like doubled down on those to where I could add the most value for my new organization. And so curious as well. You're one of the first podcast guests that we've had that's decided to make the transition, but also remain either a National Guard or Reserve component. Can you talk about that decision? Why did you decide to kind of stay involved versus just making a clean break and trying the civilian thing out? Yeah, a lot of it was because I wasn't sure. Again, like I had a lot of responsibilities. I have two kids um, and I, again, like I loved my military career. So my my identity was almost attached to military. If you think about it at the age of 17, like you create this armor, right? You, you, you kind of say, well, I, this is who I am. You allow the organization to almost become your identity. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I, I wasn't sure how to remove myself. And again, like I was, to me, it was more about like providing for my family and hoping that I loved my job. And so I said, well, if in case, I didn't love it. I needed um, stability. I can go back into the army. I couldn't do a clean breakup because of the responsibilities until I, I wasn't sure yet. 
what I wanted to do. And so, but I knew the army at the time. So I, I did a lot of research before, um, which is why I ended up going to the National Guard for the for Georgia, um, which is kind of nice. I, I prepared this a year in advance. So I've asked, you know, around kind of the differentiation between a guard or reserve and kind of what my options were before the transition. And so I decided to uh, stay in. Um, a lot of the, it was consideration for healthcare too. So we'll get into that, um, kind of the benefits, but also a lot of it was just, I, I needed that safety and in a sense of something familiar as I kind of reassess, like, I guess just figure out like who I was and who my identity was. Cause I, I couldn't figure it out at the time of my transition. I didn't know who Jessica Lucas was outside of the captain rank. So that's kind of why I stayed and I'm still in the guard. And um, I, I think I've had to learn what my purpose was and how I viewed that. Like it's easier to, to feel, feel like, oh, well, I, I did active duty where I'm going to certainly be great at the guard. Well, that wasn't true. I You can't have one foot in the door, one foot out. Like it, I just had to reframe, like, what's my purpose in the guard? Um, you know, it's not my primary career anymore at this point I still get to serve and like contribute to the community and, and be around soldiers and find fulfillment in that um and value and um you know and I've been able to network a lot too because a lot of national guards are also civilians right so I was able to network um so it's been very valuable experience for me oh great points and so can you talk a little about trying to find that purpose that identity once you take off the uniform to find out who Mr. And Mrs. Miss so and so is, and how did you go about figuring that out? Since we've been doing this since we've been kids. Yeah, well, if you think about it, like it, it was not easy. You know, I, I think we create this armor of what resilience is, right? And and people say, well, you're resilient. You're going to be fine. Yes and no. Yeah, you're you're going to be fine. You've been you know, you know that like you can face challenges and barriers and we've been trained to kind of persevere through it. But now like you don't have that structure, right? No one's going to tell you where to be. No one's going to be purposely asking, you know, or saying, hey, Jess, how are you? Your, your day, right? I don't have that battalion commander or, or anyone around me, right? So, and, and again, like finding your tribe and your community. So for me, it was kind of, I had to do a lot of self-reflection, um, I read a lot of books. I, you know, joined different organizations and communities to kind of have these conversations, um, whether it's finding a therapist, like I don't, I think mental health is so important when you transition because, you know, you've committed your life um, and you're almost so attached to your identity that now you're kind of like, well, you know, I have to kind of realize like, wow, like, okay, now what do I want to do next? Like, who am I? outside the uniform. And so I, I realized like I had to just read a lot. Um, I, I reflected a lot. It was really hard for the first year. It was really truly hard when like no one knew who I was anymore. I, you know, I had this reputation and now like I had to refine, you know, I kind of had to build my credibility and my expertise. I had a lot of imposter syndrome where I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere or more so like credibility to, to speak, even though I, you know, we've had these 10 years plus worth of amazing experience, leadership challenges um, and going to grad school. But I, you know, really had to figure out and build my confidence up and, and be vulnerable, like be very open upon like what I was feeling or being vulnerable in that sense that like, you know, try, find, trying to find a community and also being vulnerable to my even like at work, because I realized by being vulnerable, I was able to connect more with people um, from a recruiting perspective that like, hey, I've been part of your journey. Like, and through that, I was able to kind of refigure out who I was, like the value I can bring to different organizations without losing myself and just try to figure out like, where do I want to be? Who am I? Um, and it's, it's ever changing, I would say, like whether you go in different companies, it's over, you know, I'm always just re always reassessing myself, my purpose. Yeah, I'm just kind of re always recalculating my value, I guess, in a sense that, you know, what's who am I and how do I define myself 
today, but being open that, you know, the world is unpredictable, but I know I can have confidence in myself. And that's, you know, in that relationship that I have with myself is the most important. No, I agree. The I think the points in like self-confidence. And so as you look at the self-confidence and the navigation journey, you mentioned some books. Are there some resources that you use to really do that deep dive into yourself and that reflection, the introspection process? Or was it more friends and mentors kind of giving you those reflective moments? Um, I think for me it was it was two. So one was it sounds weird, but I I love um listen to a podcast and then that's how I built this by Guy Raz. And it sounds weird that I would be so like I, I think it's because of the stories, right? Like we so we feel so alone in these journeys and we feel like, you know, how am I gonna get through this? How am I gonna, you know, get myself into corporate America and rebrand myself and and build my credibility? You know, how do I translate all of my experiences? And I think for me, that podcast was just so valuable and provides so much insight for me because you hear about these co like these CEOs, like Airbnb to uh, the founder of Spanx, for example, like you hear these stories and you realize like they all like had to endure and persevere through so much, right? And for me, like just hearing those stories just helped me just build up my confidence for myself. Like, you know, we all have to start somewhere, right? And it's, it wasn't going to be easy for me. Like, instead of talking about just hearing it and resonating with their stories and kind of learning from it helped me at least. Um, and knowing a little bit more about like, help me understand different businesses from the business aspect. Um, but another one was like a command, it's called Command Purpose Foundation. Um, it's actually founded by Erin Helberg, which is class of 2012 at West Point. And her organization is like literally transitional veterans or vets um, who retired. Um, and it's just like a very, it's a women's organ, you know, women's organization, but it's really just a psychological safety of, 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 of a community. And I joined them. Um, we did like a book series um, and just having a tribe where they just understand kind of what you're going through. Um, you know, it's hard to kind of talk about it with people who, who've never experienced that transition and kind of the identity. I feel like it's the identity crisis we kind of go through. And just to have, like, just to be vulnerable with no judgment, I think that's really important in in whatever organization or tribe that you go, you know, you find is that, can I be vulnerable and open? And then, you know, again, like different books, you know, I also read like Bet on You by Angie Morgan and Courtney Lynch. They were both like Marines. Um, and they talk about like, how do you navigate and take calculated risk? And like, how do you build your confidence? Um, so those are just things that I've, you know, read and um, helped me kind of meditate and navigate through my transition. I think all amazing points. Can you also highlight a little bit, how does your transition journey and discovery process look different, not only as a, as a woman, as a Korean American, as a first generation person navigating this space, what are some of those challenges and how does your journey look different from say mine as like a, a guy or a black guy? Can you talk a little yeah. about that? I always, in my, in my mind, I'm always mindful of perspective. So for example, I was the first female in my organization and cybersecurity is already limited in a sense it's a highly competitive talent pool in addition the talent for women or women in this space is further more limited and so when I got into this space I was the only female at the time in my company um I just I started to view it in like in a sense that like man like if I was a man you know what I've had an opportunity like how am what am I projecting to make sure they feel comfortable around me you know because I know that there's certain culture and then I came um and I'm always mindful of perspective like what's going through their mind and how are they perceiving the world and who I am and how am I perceiving them and I say that because I think we all have biases whether it's you know our stories and that we have confirmation biases or whatever those you know um, narratives kind of form in your head that perfect those lenses, and I realized like you know instead of 
seeing it me versus them, like how can I fill in those gaps? Like, what do I need to do to make myself more open that uh, like this trust, like I'm very trustworthy and because trust is earned, it's not guaranteed, like as much as we want to. Right. So, and so for me, like, I think transition was just hard in a sense that now I'm a single mom and a divorced and um, in addition, like I, I live in, in a very, it's called Roswell, Georgia. So it's, it's not very common for, um, at this age for my group. Like I feel alone a lot in a sense that like, man, like my story and, and I always feel different, you know, to myself, but I, I try to have a lot of grace. You know, if we lock up like today's Martha Luther King day, we remember like what he's done and the legacy he's passed on and the remembrance of like what he was trying to do, a more equitable, equal world of a community where we all just don't see race or gender. I look at more towards like, what are the things I can do now to like remove those barriers of biases? Like, what can I do to like, make it more like to just make it more of a cohesion. So it, I think it's hard for me and it has been hard, but I think I just try to look at from the perspective of uh, someone else's lens and to be more outward. And, like what, what are they thinking? Why do they have this? And like, what can I do to, instead of like seeing it like me versus them? Like, how can I make this more unified? And just being curious, that's certainly how I've navigated this space. And from a recruiting, like I'm always trying to just be curious about people, understand their stories and share a little bit of my stories as well. Um, So maybe through our stories, something will resonate and at least we can respect each other. So hopefully that answered your question. But yeah, I think, you know, we, we always just have to be mindful. Like everyone has their stories. Everyone has their different perspective and I think it's about us trying to expand that and like doing podcasts, like sharing that knowledge and sharing their story. So hopefully people can see the world a little bit more broader than narrow. These are, you answer the question very spot on. And then I think I want to double click into this element. You mentioned kind of the vulnerability piece. And I, I, at least in my experience, I found that the vulnerability piece is challenging, especially in the military where you're kind of talking muscle through, suck it up, drive on, blah, blah, blah. So how do you kind of build that muscle or switch on kind of that vulnerability piece, especially in the professional space outside Mm -hmm. of it? Well, I don't think vulnerability comes with courage. Brene Brown, like she is, you know, if you want to hear a great talk or story, you know, how do you do it in practical? It's Brene Brown does amazing TED Talks to podcasts and books. But for me, vulnerability does not come without courage, right? So like, I think one, it takes a lot of courage to be vulnerable, right? Like to tell the world, this is who I am, right? Because we all are afraid kind of the unknown is like, how are people going to react? Like how much is too much? How much is not enough? And I, and I coached this in our, in our, you know, leadership program um, as well. And I said, if people don't know you, how do you know that like, think of a relationship, like how do they know how to best communicate with you? How can they know how to best support you? So I say like, it takes courage. Yes. But think about, you know, the receiving end and how much like you may res your stories may resonate. And I always say, do it within your comfort zone. Like it takes, you know, you can have certain boundaries. You know, I am very much like, I don't disclose so much, but I'm like, Hey, like, here's kind of my story and where I've been. Right. Um, I say like, maybe just talk about your strengths, you know, talk about what are you good at and why maybe you can start from there. Right. Um, get kind of used to that and do it with one or two people. And then maybe more and more, you're willing to disclose more, but I don't think this journey is meant to be alone. The army is so good. Like we say, you know, we, we don't like being vulnerable, but we have to be. If you think about what war is and what combat is, you are trusting that person to your left and to your right to defend you. Like, that's very vulnerable. You are like, your life is in their hands. If you think about it, like that is so vulnerable in that sense. Like you have to have a lot of courage, one, to, to, to be willing to give your life for somebody else, right? And bravery and courage. But you also need to be like, you need to trust that person to your right and to your left. So I think it's just like in the frame, it's, it's, 
how we're seeing what vulnerable is, right? Like that, what that word is. Um, but I think it's all about like being confident in yourself in the end. Like if that person doesn't receive the information well and judge you, well, maybe that person is not best in your circle or in your team. And so I think you know, like you won't know until you try, but don't forget the value you bring um, and having confidence in yourself in the end. Like the most written important person is yourself and knowing that like, hey, like I'm proud of myself for like telling these stories because you don't know who it will resonate with. And more importantly, like it's it's you like being more open to like what exposures and networking opportunities you're going to have. Cause if you don't ever put yourself out there, you know, you're not going to get those, you're not challenging yourself for, for new, for new opportunities, I would say. Resources and great points, um, especially like courage and vulnerability. I think mm-hmm. that's, that's one of the toughest lessons to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, pivoting topics a little bit. If you had to like kind of reflect on your transition journey, is there anything that you would kind of change or do differently? And by that, we mean either, you know, the time you decided to exit, your last assignment, um, education opportunities you took on, anything like that. I think one thing I would do differently was, is like, I worked during my transition leave. Like I literally left the week prior and the next week I started working because again, I needed like that security. I had children. I needed stability. Like I, I'm always on the go, go, go. Right. I try, I treated it just like a PCS instead of an ETS. And I, a couple of weeks later, I realized like, man, like I am, I was not ready for this. Right. People told me to take my time and I didn't listen. And it really was like a huge cultural shock for myself, if you think about it, like when we first went to basic training, like it was a cultural shock for us, right? Like people are yelling at you, shaving your head or, you know, and telling you to do this and that there. And you're just like, gosh, like what is going on here? Um, and it was a cultural shock for me. Um, it is because now it was kind of the tempo was different. I was so used to the structure. It wasn't you know, I, it, it just was a culture of shock for me to get like reintegrate myself with, with like civilization, I would say. And I wish I would have taken more time, you know, at least a, a month to really, you know, reflect and take a little mini sabbatical. Like, I was just always on the go and it really did wear on me eventually, like towards the end, like where I a like couple of weeks later, like I went through a huge depression because I realized like, I just, like, I didn't give myself a break to kind of re-ident, like figure out my identity. So I just really had a mental breakdown eventually just cause like, I, I just couldn't change my, like my view and how I saw the world was just the military world. So I was struggling with corporate America and kind of finding my identity. And so, you know, I would tell anyone who's transitions now, like, like you need to at least take a a month off because you think you're ready. And I have no doubt, but like, it's not even that it's about you, like who, like, how are you going to take the uniform off and how are you going to see yourself in the, in the court, you know, in the world? Um, This is a one chance, one opportunity you get to redefine who you are. And so figure that out because there are going to be challenges. You're going to be questioned or you're going to question yourself and the decisions you make or, or whatever and the challenges you will face. Um, and you need to build that confidence of who you are for yourself, most important. You know, I think that's why mental health, like mental health is so important throughout this journey is to make sure like you have like a sounding board or you make that time for yourself because it's it's not like you're preparing for war but like it is a new chapter it's a new it's you're going back into a new like it's like the the language is not the same you know there's a lot of nuances that are just unfamiliar and at the time and you're gonna have to kind of you know conform in a sense that like what that language is and how they do things culturally or with an organization um that's just different from what you're accustomed to very accurate 
And so in that culture shock, what's kind of the most jarring piece, at least from your perspective, is it the new language? Is it the internal politics? Is it the way that people kind of communicate their expectations and leadership? What are kind of some of those elements, I guess, the top two that you're like, okay, like I didn't understand this. And if I had to do it all over again, these are two yeah. pieces that the better. I think it's the unclear expectations, you know, in the military, like there's so much great things fundamentally we do. Like, for example, like, you know, you know, you have your one-on-one session, you know, when you onboard with your commander, whoever your boss is with set expectation, here's your job job description, here's my self-assessment. So you kind of understand like from an expectation. And, And again, like the military has been around for years, you know, and we have set foundations already of what's expected for certain roles, right? Maybe some roles are just ambiguous, but and, and that gets more and more so as you go to strategic positions. But it's it's very clear when in, in you know when I transition and I went to this new company, Airbus 360. Like I was like, I'm not quite sure. Like what what are the what are my expectations to feedback? Like, what is expect? How do I know I'm performing well? Like, how do I ensure that, like, I'm living up to your expectations of what this role is? But, you know, being in a startup, you wear all many roles. Um, but that was a little jarring for me is, you know, like, well, how do I know I'm a high performer? Like, I'm very competitive. Like, how do I know I'm exceeding those expectations? Um, in addition to the language, right? Like, I went to a whole different new world of, like, cloud infrastructure to, like, K- KPIs and you know or like um and so I was like well like what does this mean like what are I, I don't really understand in addition to the language but I think for me the biggest thing was like having clear expectations and you know command guidance of like well what do you want me to do you know that's that's gonna be you know impactful to the mission right what is our mission so I think that was a little bit it was drawing for me because I wanted to make sure I aligned. So, agree, agree. That that's are those are solid points. Um, I think the other question, in terms of the tools that you use on your day to day job, I feel like often in the military we tend to be a bit antiquated in some of the systems that we use, whether it's to manage HR or weapons, serial numbers, you name it. Um, can you talk a little about the adjustment in using different tools and like how that ramp up looked? Yeah, I would say, unfortunately, in the HR community, there is not one stop shop, right? Uh, there's a lot of different softwares. And, and so I got to demo a lot of different softwares, which is great. Like, I didn't have to wear for this big funding and all this has to get approved. And it's two years later. So I did get to like test drive a lot of softwares. Um, there is for certain software fatigue, I would say, like there's a little bit of a lot of different softwares and I've learned that they don't integrate as well. So I had to kind of be creative and innovative and create buffers in between because, you know, what the military does teach us well, or at least like ingrain into our brain and made me think about like business processes and it's a, it's a continuity, right? Like what's your contingency plan? So I still go use Excel. Like, I don't know why I should trust these softwares, but I'm always just like, well, if, you know, the world came to an end or they got hacked, right? I work in a world where we think of like adversaries. So, you know, um, and I'm like, well, if we got hacked, like I need to have a different, you know, I need to have like a backup drive or somewhere. So I still use Excel for certain data to, you know, for certain metrics because for me, like there's not a one-stop shop for the most part, like each software does a little bit of everything. But if I need to brief in real time or something, you know, I do use an Excel spreadsheet. So I think that came in very handy from being in the military with limited resources. So I would say like, we are very much, we know how to be creative with the resources we're given because in the military, you kind of have to deal with what you got. And so I think like that is something that I brought with me that I'm glad I did. Because I always think like two steps ahead, like, well, if something happened, like, where's my data? Um, You know, where am I storing it? So, um, but other than that, like, I mean, I did learn a lot of all these different softwares, which has been really fun and cool. Like you see the innovative sides that you're like, man, I wish we had this, like when I was, you know, 
working on spreadsheets all day um, to have something that's seamless. And uh, so that's been fun. But I think at the same time, like I still use spread, you know, Excel. <laughs> so there, there are definitely some better ways that are out there and uh, yeah. it's helpful to learn those tools. I think you've, you've had a lot of amazing people, Jessica. I kind of want to pivot topics. Um, this will be more broadly talking about your role as an HR person and some of, some of the pro tips for veterans that are looking to make the pivot. So kind of talking about whether it's recruitment, interviews, HR benefits, kind of some of those pro tips. And so to start off, can you tell us like, hey, let's say I'm 90 days out from transitioning. How should I be thinking about you know, recruitment and interviews just kind of broadly? So let's say, hey, I want to work at Risk Sleep 60. What should I be doing? Should I be reaching out to fellow veterans like you? Like, what should I be doing to like make sure I nail this job and like get through the door? Yeah. So I'm very familiar with that. Um, being, you know, one going through that kind of journey and transition, but also talking to vets myself on a you know day to day basis. Um, so one first thing is, let's say you are 90 days, is make sure your resume looks good, right? Because that is the one thing, that is your one foot into the door. There are multiple ways, but, you know, if someone's going to give you the time, I call it, you know, informational interview, let's just say you're just trying to understand a little bit about the company, um, your resume has to look good. And, you know, that's, again, that is kind of your brand in, in like pivoting into the trying to get a door with your resume. So making sure that looks clean, you know, one pager, making sure it's not too much lingo. Um, cause again, you're talking to another party that may have no military background. So they're not going to know what a con op is, right. Making sure there's measurables, KPIs, right. Like making sure that there is numbers associated cost, right. Cause either you're going to be a revenue generator or cost container in organizations, right. They care about money. Money is very important in corporate America. So, um, making sure you have tangible values, um, but yeah, making sure you have a LinkedIn account and network. Networking is so important and veterans always want to help vets, you know, more than anything. So if you know a couple of things to look for in organization, there's these things called higher vets medallions. So you can see they'll they'll ha have it on their website. You know that they're vet veteran friendly and they probably have veterans within the organization when they have these medallions. You can go on higher vets um, it, and you can look and they'll have like, here's your awardees for these, from these various companies. Um, they actually are vetted. They have to do an SCD. They have to have certain retention numbers and L&D programs and initiatives to make sure they, they are, you know, continually investing into veterans to make sure they're investing into their career growth. And so doing that, um, uh, like making sure you're, you're, you're you know, network and, and ping people, message people, you know, because you never know, you may get that one opportunity, right, with, you know, maybe they're the VP, or maybe you don't know what positions they may have within that organization, what power and influence they may have, they can be the hiring manager. Um, so just be open to just like, this is where the vulnerability comes in, like drop your ego aside, and just be curious, just be curious about the organization, say, hey, I'm you know, I'm looking to pivot, like any word of advice you can give me, right? And like, and come prepared when they give you that one shot. These are busy people. And clearly they want to give you their time to invest in you, even for five minutes. You make sure you do your homework. Don't, don't waste our time. That five minutes is very valuable and you don't know your first impressions do matter. You know, make sure you're doing your due diligence, but you know, again, like be open to just being vulnerable and just pinging people. I'm always like, if a veteran ever pings me on LinkedIn, I will always make time for them. Great point. So making sure that once you kind of have that contact point, just going in with a, a, a learner's mindset, be intellectually curious and Absolutely. willing to admit what you don't know. <laughs> Absolutely. Along those lines, are there better avenues than others to approach respective companies, whether it's a military veterans recruiting conference or, you know, a LinkedIn outreach and cold call or just applying blindly, I guess, what are your thoughts there? Because sometimes it's very nebulous. Yeah, absolutely. You know, unfortunately, and I, you know, I tell college students this too, that, you know, a lot of these 
big companies, you know, behemoth companies, they're getting 2,000 applicants a day, right? And there's AI involved to kind of pinpoint, they're going to, their job and ultimately is to find whoever meets the best requirements for that job description, right? That That is very nebulous, you know, and it's very competitive still, especially for those entry-level positions. And so finding one, like, if you can network, like, again, like, there's so many great organizations, like SkillBridge to Hire Heroes to American Corporate Partners, like, trying to find an avenue in di- that's different, right? Like people, one, you know that companies invested because they have sponsors, they probably spot, you know, have volunteers in these different organizations to kind of mentor a veteran. So, you know, they're very veteran friendly in that sense that they're willing to invest, right? Because they already have within the organization. Going ahead and like trying to go through those routes instead of just applying, still apply, right? Like still do it, still apply because you don't know. And But if you really want to differentiate yourself and get ahead, I would try to figure out those different initiatives that different companies have and going through that way. Every company's different. You know, my company, we're smaller. So it is easier just to ping me or, you know, you have to look at the size of that company too. Um, But if you know they're in the recruiting and even recruiting, they'll be like military, like veteran, like these, you know, even their recruiting department is broken out to like on-campus hiring to, you know, veteran initiatives, you know, going that route, um, making sure you're, you're networking with them or at least sending them a message as you apply. So at least they know like, hey, this person like took this initiative to send me a message because one that really should have done your due diligence, but two, then like your name will kind of, they'll remember that, you know, they're like, oh, you know, um, Joe Smith, you know, I remember he messaged me and he applied. So using different methods, because in the end, like, I don't, you know, yeah, you don't know that you need luck and opportunity may come that, that one time that you actually did that. Oh, amazing points. So one kind of, once you kind of an, a company identified trying to find those veteran avenues, whether it's the veteran recruiter or other veterans that work at the company to kind of bring you up to speed mm-hmm. and still so along the line once you get to the interview process hopefully I guess how should you be preparing you know whether it's more case-based or informational behavioral interview mm-hmm. how should you be thinking about those questions so they're not like hey you know I was I did 40 combat patrols and I was platoon <laughs> and they're like any of that means help me out <laughs> Yeah. So one, making sure you look at the job description, right? Look at the job opening that they have and what you applied for. Making sure you're you can showcase those skill sets, and even if you don't have all of the ex- required experiences, you still have relevant experiences, right? Like leading a team, you know, um, finance. Well, you had to be very resourceful in the military. So looking at that job description to understand, like, how would I answer these questions, right? In a way that they can understand. I always say, ask for a cousin who's never had and been, been in the military. See if they can understand what you're saying, right? Like, don't ask another vet. Like, ask someone who's actually never been in the military and see if they can understand, you know, like what you're what you're telling them, right? So use those. Um, but two, like making sure, yeah, like read the job description, research the company, making sure that you understand what they're doing, right? I, I always tell um, candidates or, you know, when I go to a different organizations that I can know in the first five minutes if you didn't research my firm, you know, because I'll ask open-ended questions like, well, tell me what about my company, you know, intrigued you, Right. And it could be core values. That's great. Like you understand, like these companies want to build great organization. They're looking for, I call it the 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 missionaries, people who want to be with a company 10 years from now, invest, right? And like grow with the company and be the next leaders, right? Um, you know, so they they don't want people who are just in and out all the time. They want people, good companies, want good people that are going to grow and like be a part and be that deep, smart institutional foundations. So making sure you you really research that firm, right? Like understand their values. What are they, what what are they doing? Like what's their mission? You know, what's their niche in the market? Um, and then also you should be, this is a two-way dialogue. I always say that like, as much as you're trying to impress that company, that company, you need to make sure that company impresses you. Like, this is your career. 
you know, like you don't, I mean, I get it. We all kind of get into like, well, I just need a job. No, life is too short. You're already the hardest thing, which is making that transition, right? Whether it's retirement or whatever, like you've sacrificed your life. Like you've done so much for this community and for this country. Like this is the one opportunity you get to advocate for yourself, right? Like truly advocate for yourself of who you want to be and how you want to take your career. Um, so be, be curious. Like it is so much time and investment as a candidate, like all the sacrifices you made to even be at that point, like make sure this is a good fit for you, right? Like you don't want to be doing it again in two years. Like, so ask hard questions. Cause that means one, you've thought about it. You've actually know what you're putting yourself into. And like, you've reflected, like you're, you're not uncertain what you want to do. You're not like, well, I, I don't know if I want to transition or I don't know if I want to get into this career field. So making sure that like you come up with great questions, ask some hard questions, challenge them because that company owes you those answers. Like you don't want to go into a company and like they communicate brand these things. And I said, it's false, pro false promises, right? They don't live up to like the promises that they've delivered. So, or they've communicated to you in their pitch. So making sure like they're exceeding your expectations, you know, what are my career developments? Like how, what are you going to do to invest into my growth? Because that's really important. You know, you want a company that's going to invest time and, you know, efforts into you and where you want to be. So really like kicking the tires, checking the engine to see what is this car actually run like versus, mm -hmm. you know, the ads. So the difference between an army promotional, like, advertisement or you're like be all you can be oh yeah that's great and then you're like oh i'm in the army you're like ah this is what they didn't tell me exactly exactly those you know army recruiting brand and yeah i said that's not all great and fun but you're seeing that you know the infantry doing a cool mission not the admin doing the back end works and um things like that but just making sure right like i always say like this is a one opportunity you get like take full advantage of it. Um, and you should be also making sure this is good for you. You know, good fit for you and great opportunity for where you want to be at least a stepping stone. Oh, great point. So now let's say we've, we've moved past the initial recruitment and the interview. I now have a job offer at X great company. Mm -hmm. And they're like, hey, the offer, like, what should I be doing next? Should I, you know, accept immediately? Should I? you kind of like negotiate and like see if I can get more money like how should I be thinking about this especially as someone that the army just tells me this is what I get paid at this many right numbers. um I would say you got to look at from a total comp right and and like I do for me because again like this journey and and that is such a very familiar to me and things I would have liked to know. Like I am very much like, we're going to talk about benefits. We're going to do this in your offer letter. What should be addressed is one, are you exempt or not exempt? That does matter because you need to know what your rights are. Like you, if you're a salary or you non-salary, are you hourly? Cause you have different rights, right? So I always make sure are you exempt or not exempt? Cause now we're going to talk about like, Hey, if you're exempt, you're a salary employee. If you're not exempt, you're in more of an hourly, so making sure that your hourly rates worth the federal regulations, they meet the minimum requirement, uh, making sure that, you know, hey, like if I go overtime, what's that like? So it doesn't matter, like making sure you know, like, how are they hiring me? Most likely you're going to be looking at salary, so you're going to be exempt. Um, so that being said, you have your salary, you have a base salary. Most companies are going to have a bonus. And then of that, now you have to consider the benefits. That's why I say, look at that from a total comp. And um, that's the one thing that like in the military it was hard for us to know, right? Like we knew BAH, but we didn't know the value of our benefits, right? Um, those benefits really matter from medical, dental, vision. Um, what are your options? And so they should address that to you. So for my company, we pay for your premiums. So that means you come with us, we pay your monthly premiums um, as a company and you just owe for your dependents. Um, some companies don't, right? Or maybe they only contribute some, you know, 50, 50% 50 of your premiums. Making sure you know that. And you can actually ask them, hey, like, 
can I see, it's called summary of benefits. Can I see the SBCs? Like, I want to know like what my deductions are because not only do you have a premium, right? So think of it like you have a premium monthly fee. Yes, like in regular insurance, it's like an insurance for a house. Like you got your monthly insurance, right? For car insurance, but then you have your deductibles, you know, and co-payments. And so making sure you understand what all of that package means, because that can be a lot of, you know, for you and your family, let's just say, or if you don't have a family, making sure you understand, like, it, this is like life events, you know, so you can like, if you want to have children, like, okay, so what's the best plan for me? If it's just myself, okay, like, what's, how do, you know, like, what is my, within my financial means or comfort, right? That, um, so you can weigh in the pros and cons, that's best for you. That's where the health savings comes into play. Are you, you know, you usually don't are very healthy. and You don't go to the, you know, you don't see preventative care very often. Um, then probably you should have like a health savings plan, right? Whatever you're comfortable with. Um, but you can ask these companies, you know, when you have your offer letter, hey, can I have a summer benefit so I understand like the copayment deduction overall cost of the maintenance for this insurance and what it means, you know, always they will be willing to provide that for you, at least provide some insight. So that way you understand like my healthcare benefits, like, okay, like what's the cost of this? And then consider that with your offer letter, because that really does help you from a total comp understand the value of like, you know, the compensation. Amazing points. Um, and so when you look at kind of some of those benefits, I think some veterans, you know, when you're doing that comparison, you may miss some of the tax advantages where it's like, oh, well, the age isn't taxed. And so like, I think I'll need to make this much, but based on the benefits that I'm leaving behind, I need to make this much more. Can you kind of talk a little bit about that to make it's sure that, mm-hmm. to make sure they're, they're counting all of their benefits and getting the right value for looking the right kind of job and salary on the outside? Mm. So now I just talked about healthcare. So let's talk about some like leave, right? How much vacation time do you get? And again, this is where a lot of people care about hybrid, you know, like, um, you know, cost analysis of like daycare expenses and, and having more flexibility in your life. Um, so looking at, and it's hard to put a dollar, to be honest, like, oh, I, I try to, I, I can't put a dollar to it from like the other benefits, like I, they call it lifestyle benefits. I don't know why, but, you know, hybrid to education, but most certifications, especially if you work for professional services or even like most companies will offer you some sort of educational benefits and um, they'll pay for certain credentials or credit uh, certifications. Most certifications can cost up to $2,000. Right. So like looking at like the other benefits, you can ask them like, hey, what are some of the reimbursement programs from certifications? You know, that's where your career, you know, like career comes into play of like, okay, what do you do for 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 me? So we in our total compensation at, as our, at our company, I estimate about two thousand dollars and just certifications like, hey, like we're going to invest in you. You can go get certification that's relevant to your career or what you do within your job. And so like we estimate about $2,000. In addition, we'll give you a gadget budget. So I line item it. So anything that's branded um, on the employee culture site, let's just say, like if I go to Google, they probably brand, like here's kind of all our benefits we offer and perks. Making sure that you ask them, what's the dollar value to that? And you can blatantly ask them because if they're branding it, they already know the cost and expense of it from a company perspective. So make sure you ask them like, hey, what is the cost of, this because some of some of them like we again we we do unlimited pto but some of them like have dollars to like okay pto like how much is that worth and you know because some people you know they need to cash it out or something like that like you can ask them you know whoever's going to give you the offer and usually it'll always be hr like that gives you the offer letter within the organization um say hey like can you, can you help me understand like the value of this benefit because then that way you have a whole picture of the total comp points and then you mentioned the hsa and i've heard of an fsa can you explain what that is to our listeners as well yeah so the hsa is like your health savings and so accounts what that means is they'll contribute most companies will contribute a, you know a certain amount and then you contribute a certain amount think of it like a 401k um and you get like a debit card and you can like it, it usually it's called your high deductible plan it's a little bit more expensive but 
the, the freedom that you get is like within your accounts, those fundings that you get, you can use it for other investments. So now you have more control of like understanding like what's being expensed, like how am I using my funds, you know, and visitations. Um, so I, I think in, for me, like the way that I've interpreted it, 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 it like has you better control and better like financial analysis of like your health care, you know, um, and a little bit more freedom and flexibility because not everyone goes to the hospital twice a year, right? Maybe you're just very healthy and now you can take those additional funds and maybe, do, you know, do it like maybe invest in something else, right? So you have a little bit more flexibilities of those funds and what you want to do with that. So those are ideal for, you know, again, like I say, it's just depending on your family circumstance and like what you're comfortable with. I have certain family members also do HSA because um, they do more holistic med- medicine or something like that. They don't go to hospitals, you know, and think they use alternative medicine or things like that. That's best for their family. So it just gives you a little bit more flexibility. Sounds especially as you're adjusting from, hey, you know, TRICARE takes care of everything and I don't have to worry about the premiums and the co-pays. Yeah. And yeah. It's just, uh, uh, yes. I really, my first company, they were like, oh yeah, like the individual plan annually is like $2,500 a year. And, you know, if you have a family, it's $4,500 a year. And I was like, oh wow, this is like a really big benefit that I didn't count for when I left the military. Yes, no, absolutely. But I guess like the other positive perspective is you actually have you can shop around for your primary care and who you go to so that there was pros and cons now you can kind of you know look at like within network oh yeah and you have to look within network because you need to make sure they accept your insurance so each company especially like every company if you're over 50 they're going to have what's called a, a, a patient advocate So they always should, and always ask them, would you have a patient advocate? So what they do is they help you from more personal outside your organization. Usually they work for the healthcare broker. They actually will find you a provider that actually help you understand your benefits and your bills, right? Like don't be just paying it upfront, like making sure like, hey, like, is this bill correct? Like they help you kind of break down those bills to helping you understand like what's within network, help you find the best care for you and your family. Like, hey, we're new to this area. You know, I need to find a pediatrician that has these great ratings. Like, do you have any recommendations? So making sure that you kind of utilize the resources within those companies. Cause again, like it can be so overwhelming, but again, like that's where the vulnerability, like take your pride, swallow it. Like there are, there are resources out there within these organs to make sure you have a successful transition and that more importantly, you and your family are taken care of. Um, Cause it, you know, that's an, a, that's a, I call it table stakes from a retention standpoint. So Use those client and patient advocates, making sure you have all the resources to make sure you know like what's best for your family from a healthcare plan to, you know, serve it like providers. And then along those lines, uh, we talked briefly about PTO and vacation policy. Um, I heard maternity and wellness benefits are becoming a bit more common. Can you talk briefly what, what, what questions should I be asking about things like that? So one is understanding your state. So every slave, there's there actually state labor laws. So um, I would always tell individuals, make sure that you make sure you know what your, your rights are too. Like um, if you're in, in California, it's California's laws are very different from Georgia laws, right? From a labor law. So you, that's all like open source. So making sure you kind of go through that too. Cause that, again, like when you, do your um, negotiation, you should not be signing things. And it's not that they're not willing to provide that information because they have to, but maybe they're not sure. Maybe they're not knowledgeable in it. So making sure you do your due diligence, like there's a lot of laws or, or, or things coming about like a compliance for parental leave, for example, like, you know, um, legislation comes down. And um, so it's called FEMA, uh, no, FMLA, but making sure you know, like, you know, California, again, like very much like you have to afford this much parental leave, paternity leave and maternity leave. A lot of organization, the trend now is calling primary and secondary care. They're calling it, they're changing it because they, again, like because of the EEO discrimination, um, they're, they're actually changing. So you'll see parental leave. Um, but you can ask them that as part of like, when you, your interview and your negotiation. Tell me a little bit more. 
Um, but again, making sure that you do your due diligence for state because it may be a new state for them. You know, now with remote work, it is changing like a lot of organizations, making sure they're updating their policies, and making sure they're more specific on these state laws and making sure it's addressed so you know your rights as an employee. But do your due diligence first. Like the again, this is open source, go to state labor laws and making sure like, hey, what are the policies my state says they have to abide by? You know, so like I would do that and then go ahead and talk to your, you know, employee about it. Because again, like, you know, you don't know what you don't know, but you want to be armed with information. So at least you can bring it to the table and say, hey, I read my state that like I'm owed this much, you know, leave or, you know, not chargeable. It should be, you know, and things like that, like making sure that you, you kind of bring that to the table. And so from there, I know we've covered a lot in terms of toe compensation and interviewing recruiting. Are there any other elements that you'd like to kind of elaborate on that I, I didn't highlight, especially based on your robust experience in HR? Yeah. So I think another thing is from compensation, like base, right? Like you don't know, right? Especially when you're new, you're like, I don't know. Like, how do I even know I'm paid fairly? You're going to look at like kind of your comp from the military, right? And you say, well, I should be making this much making sure like you're going to credible sources. There is a lot of open sources, right? And now with these transparency laws being enforced in different states, now like, like federal wants to enforce it. But so a lot of uh, organizations are already kind of creating, like when you look at the job description, job posting, they're going to have like the, the salary ranges, but those salary ranges are actually quite broad, to be honest. Like they're not within, a, you know, what's 20, like within a reasonable um, range or like, good heavens, this is like a hundred K difference. <laughs> so, you yeah. know, what I always tell people is go and go self-serve, go to salary.com. Like that's a credible source. Um, uh, Glassdoor has some, like there's a lot of open source that you can kind of from a candidate perspective, like, Hey, like what should be my salary ranges within the market for, you know, this skill set or this job description, and there's always nuances you have to consider, but like do that as a, a foundation. Like again, like negotiations, understanding, like being armed with information. So saying, hey, I know from a market, don't say from the military because that's not relevant anymore, unfortunately, right? Like you can't say, well, in the military, I was making, you know, 120 all in comp. Well, you're not in the military anymore, you know? So making sure you're educated for the position you're competing for and those skill sets, right? And making sure, well, what is the market telling me based off this job description and job posting? What should I be being paid based off of market value? Oh, great points. And so, you know, one, we really do appreciate your time, but if people want to kind of like learn more both about your journey and how to better navigate, you know, the hiring recruiting process, HR benefits, like where can they reach out to learn more about your story? Yeah, on LinkedIn and um, just Jessica Lucas, and then also on our website at risk360.com. And um, they, you know, they have like a little sneak peek of, you know, a little summary on me. But really, for me, it's all about just message me on LinkedIn. Like you can always, you know, message me or just email me at jessica.lucas at risk360.com. Again, like I, I always want to help veterans. Um, if you're hearing this podcast, you're already invested for you know into your future um, and being curious. So I'm always willing to have a conversation with anybody and figure out you know how can how how, how can I help you and you know just hear your stories again. Like this is hard. This is hard stuff. It's always a, a journey because you know maybe in two years you'll be going to Google or something, but. You know, this is hard. It's it's hard stuff, and but it's not meant to be alone, right? Um, so knowing that there are people that want to be a part of your journey um, and and really want to help and give advice because we've all been there one way or another, making sure you know that you know there is a community out there that wants to help, and just like how you did your podcast. So, um, you know, we were all here to just share each other's journeys and see how we can help each other. And then are there any other like initiatives that you're working on or side hustles or books or anything that you're working on like side products that you'd like to share with our audience? 
Yeah. So I, um, I, I just started off our learning and uh, leadership and development program, RIS360. It's called a journeyman program where we help people transition more into leadership role. Um, and we always associate leadership by position, like CEOs, but I so leadership is the ability of attitude and the ability to influence, right? So it's attitude and ability to influence and whether you're a leader of position or strategy um, or leader of people or strategy. So I'm always really, I really like, my initiatives are more centrally about people and making people better, you know, um, leaders within their organization or how do organization really give back to their people, right? People, their secret sauces. So I'm giving a talk. Um, in March, at um, it's called Isaka, but it's a chapter in Atlanta. It's more geared for cybersecurity, but you know the biggest thing in a very high high competitive market is people. Like, how do you recruit and retain people? So I'll be giving a talk there. But I'm always in different uh, recruiting efforts to help expand, do further outreach to you know minorities or women, or I mean, or just you know people who would just never had that you know, hey, I, I want to, I want someone to take at that for me, you know, so I'm always trying to find people and, and do different initiatives that can further expand the pie and bring more people into the space of cybersecurity. Uh, yeah, those are kind of the things I'm working on. Um, and so it's, it's exciting. And hopefully, uh, years from now, I can, you know, have a book or be on a TED talk, but we'll see. <laughs> You're well on your way. I mean, yeah. late bouncing, you know, mom, uh, National Guard uh, job. I mean, that's that's a that's a full plate. A yeah. Full plate. Mm-hmm. You could carve out some time for us and chat with our guest today. Well, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, really.